trails, paths amid the forests, animal traces, stream beds, and they were traveled for many years by prehistoric Indians, by the Cherokee, by the Spanish, and by the white settlers. And we became a settled land, a region apart. Here are the eastern states, and here are the mountains. These Appalachian Mountains began in the far north, in Canada and the rocky coasts of Maine, the remnants of great clashes of the plates of the earth many millions of years ago. As these mountains meander south, they separate, and in southern Pennsylvania, a low ridge slowly rises, dividing from the western chain. It's the beginning of that great series marking the easterly Appalachians, with the Alleghenies further to the west. As these mountains march on to the south, they become wider until the eastern face is a wall of mountain jutting far above the Piedmont floor, a barrier to any movement to the west. And here is North Carolina with its three regions, the coastal plains, the Piedmont, and the west, that region cut off by the mountain face. This is western North Carolina, the region where the Appalachians swell to their largest width and greatest height. It's a land of separation, cut off from the east by 150 miles of high wall, the escarpment of the Blue Ridge. It's a land of cross ridges with peaks over 6,000 feet, crowned by dark fir forests. It's the land where eastern North America divides, sending the mountain waters east to the Atlantic, west to the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico. This line is called the Eastern Continental Divide. But most of all, western North Carolina is a unique land with a difference in geography, history, and culture. Before humans wandered this land, there were the animals. And where they walked, they left small paths. These animals were making the first trails as they followed the easiest ways, the water paths and the gentle slopes. Then came man, searching for food, for land, for shelter from aggression. These humans followed the valleys cut by streams and rivers, looking for natural passes marking the low places between the hills. And deer track gave way to bare feet, bare feet to moccasins, and ancient trails wound their ways through the prehistorical southern Appalachians. These were the first people of western North Carolina, the mound builders. Little is known of these ancient people. They left few marks on the land except for unreadable petroglyphs and strange mounds. Over a thousand years ago, they inhabited the greater Mississippi Valley, raising their mounds in the Ohio Valley, in Missouri, in western North Carolina, and elsewhere. And then, like the mountain mist, they were gone. Maybe it was the trails of the mound builders that the Cherokee followed. Perhaps there were too many years in between, and the Cherokee followed the animal paths. For the land recovers from man, given time. But the Cherokee came, settled, farmed, formed villages and towns in the low mountains of the southern Appalachians. Their towns were small, usually numbering only 20 to 50 families but some were larger. The Cherokee towns were surrounded by their fields where they grew the squash, beans, and other crops that made up much of their livelihood. Having no horse-drawn plows or metal tools, the Cherokee burned the trees and underbrush and scratched out furrows in which to plant. They also hunted with blowguns, spear, and bow. They needed land to hunt in, 
and so the Cherokee fought to keep claim to far more land than their farming centers. And the Cherokee were not alone. Other tribes claimed adjoining lands, and paths grew between the lands for trade or war. These were paths for the feet of fast-moving warriors or heavily loaded backs, for these North American Indians had no horses, no pack animals, no wheeled vehicles, and the trails remained narrow amidst the dark forests. And then came a change, a change from faraway Europe. In 1540, a new people came, the Spanish, coming north from Florida, led by Hernando de Soto, who wanted to be a leader of the empire the Spanish were building, and the mountains first heard the sound of gunfire. The brush was pushed back by strange four-footed animals that carried men on their backs. Guided by a captive woman, the Lady of Cofidachiki, the Spanish picked their way through the ancient trails, crossing ridges until they descended to the site of the ancient mound of Nikwasi. They came seeking gold, and finding none left to go further west, where they left De Soto's body in the great waters of the Mississippi. The Cherokee were alone again, but not for long. In 1567 came Juan Pardo, another conquistador from the Florida colony. Pardo brought shot, steel, and death to those who stood in his path. No one knows where he entered or stayed in western North Carolina, but he found gold here. And for 125 years, small secretive groups of Spaniards came north from Florida to lead pack horses with gold out of the mountains. With the coming of the English and the exclusion of the Spanish, the source of the gold was lost. It's still there, somewhere. In the late 1500s, the English came, first to fail at Roanoke Island, then to barely survive at Jamestown, Virginia, and soon after, just a little more than a century after the Spanish, to settle Charleston, the largest town of that colony they called Carolina. These newest settlers learned to grow strange Indian foods, especially the all-purpose corn, and discovered the addictive quality of tobacco. But they quickly discovered that wealth could be gained by trading with the Indians. So the first English traders came, following the broad, deep rivers that led to the mysterious interior. They traded iron, hatchets, knives, Pots of metal that did not break like the clay, shiny jewelry, cloth, mirrors, and other items unknown to the Stone Age Cherokee. They traded for the white tanned skin of the deer, the stretched skin of the beaver, the fox, the mink, the melted fat of bear grease, and other items offered by the Tuscarora, the Catawba, and the other eastern tribes. Ever in search of new trade, the English used the rivers to cross the coastal plain, enter the rolling Piedmont, and by the late 1600s, the most adventuresome few were taking back to Williamsburg and Charleston tales of the land of Blue Mountains, a barrier that shut them off from the land beyond. From the Virginia and Lower Carolina settlements they came, following the rivers that led toward the mountains, they were sent by the colonial governors and by private businessmen, all hungry for the profits of the Indian trade. Often unlettered, rarely remembered, these early explorers searched out the ancient paths into the mountain fastness. The exploits of only a few are known. In 1670, John Letterer was sent out by Virginia's governor, William Berkeley and Letterer wandered along the eastern face of the Blue Ridge, abandoned by his eastern Indian guides. Letterer wondered if any person could ever find a path across these blue mountains. Another attempt came from Virginia in 1673. Hired by private traders to open a route to the Cherokee, James Needham 
and Gabriel Arthur left Fort Henry near Petersburg and went to the valley of the Adkin River in Upper Carolina. They met a Cherokee hunting party and were given directions into the interior. Needham left no trail markers, but he eventually led his little party into the Cherokee towns of the Upper Plateau. Going further through the passes of the Pigeon River, he reached Chota, capital of the Overhill Cherokee, located west of the Unicas in the Great Tennessee Valley on the western slope of the Appalachians. But there, Needham was killed in a dispute with the Cherokee. It was over a year before young Arthur managed to get back to Virginia, carrying much information, but no maps of the route to the interior. The next year came a young Englishman named Henry Woodward. Starting from Charleston in 1674, Woodward made several trips into the land of the Cherokee on the headwaters of the Kiowee River and its tributaries. He reported to his backers, I have discovered a country so delicious, pleasant, and fruitful, yet were it cultivated, doubtless it would prove a second paradise. Woodward had proved a geographical truth. Since rivers run downhill, the lower Carolina traders found they had easier access to the hill country than did the Virginians. These early explorers were searching for trade routes. What they discovered were ancient trails that skirted the eastern edge of the Blue Ridge, paths used for north-south movement by many generations of Cherokee, Catawba, and other tribes. The South Carolina traders discovered what DeSoto had found. The southern Appalachians are lower and softer, offering possible routes. And in the valleys, there were the Cherokee towns, connected by small footpaths. The traders had not only discovered a people hungry for trade, but these Europeans had the means of getting trade items to them and getting the wealth of the Cherokee out. By 1718, as many as 360 pack horses would be strung together to carry trade goods to the Cherokee country and the South Carolinians built forts and trading posts ever closer to the Cherokee country. They also discovered something else. Once they reached the mountains and climbed that scarp, the rivers flowed west, and that was the territory of the Empire of France. The greatest river they found there they called the French Broad, but the rivers of the mountains were shallow, rocky, and often whitewater, they were not like the deep and calm rivers of the coastal plains and Piedmont, and the mountain region remained closed to settlers who wanted open lands, wagon routes, and easy access to more populated areas. The colonies of North and South Carolina were separated by political lines shortly after 1710, but geography is stronger than political lines. The trade routes, like the rivers, tied western North Carolina to South Carolina and through the path skirting the Blue Ridge Scarp to Virginia. The trails did not lead due east to coastal North Carolina where the towns of New Brunswick, Bath, Edenton, and Newburn were growing. In 1740, a Virginia hunter named Stephen Holstein broke through the Blue Ridge. He found a broad, fertile land to the west. The river he found is still called the Holston. That way through the mountains to the great valley of Tennessee was opening. To these lands just opening, a new force was coming, a people whose hunger for land was combined with a distaste for the eastern towns with their increasingly restrictive English governments. They were the Scotch-Irish. Welcomed by the Pennsylvania colony, they came by the thousands from the poverty of Northern Ireland. With little money for land purchases, they left Philadelphia, following a natural break in the Blue Ridge in Pennsylvania. The valley between Appalachians and Alleghenies they could follow to the Virginia frontier and the headwaters of the rivers that led to the Virginia coast. They broke through the Blue Ridge into the headwaters of the Dan River and over the ridges to the headwaters of the Yadkin. 
They came 400 miles to find empty land in the western North Carolina Piedmont. In 1750, one of these Scotch-Irish families came just that route to settle on the Yadkin, helping build the town of Moxville, and with them came a son named Daniel. Daniel Boone was to be a wanderer all his life, and he soon wandered the headwaters of the Yadkin to a small upland plateau that would one day carry his name. In 1753 came another land-hungry people, the Moravians, following as had the Boones the great Pennsylvania road. These German Anabaptists settled in the land they called Wachovia and built their sturdy homes there. These western Piedmont settlements were not in the mountains, but they pointed the way to the hazy western escarpment. One of the offshoots of this busy Pennsylvania road led into the upper plateau country west of the Blue Ridge, the valley of the New River, where early settlers were later surprised to find they were residents of North Carolina. They thought they were still in Virginia. Western North Carolina was getting its first settlers here in the far northwestern corner of the colony. But these settlers looked to Virginia for supplies and government. That's the way the valleys and trails led. In the 1760s, Boone laid out a trail from the Yadkin headwaters to the Holston River, following animal tracks, Indian paths, earlier hunters, and his own nose. Other events helped open the way west. The French and Indian War ended in 1763, and the victorious English expelled the French from the Mississippi Basin. Combined with the opening of Boone's Road, this political event opened the way across the mountains. Settlers started looking to the fabled lands of the west, the Valley of the Tennessee. Some came from North Carolina, more came when the Pennsylvania Road broke through the western part of Virginia, and they called the new lands the Holston Settlement, the Watauga Country, Franklin, and after the Revolution, Tennessee. But Boone's Trail and its offshoots were not meant to settle western North Carolina. They were to lead across the mountains to Tennessee and the fabled blue grass of Kentucky. These land-hungry settlers crossed these mountains on foot, both human and animal. The trails were far too steep and mountainous for wagons. They were going into a land ungoverned by the English. But even as patriots were talking of independence in the East, the Revolutionary War came to the North Carolina frontier. True to their treaties with the English, the Cherokee attacked all along the Appalachian frontier in the spring of 1776 under the leadership of Dragging Canoe. The settlers took refuge in fortified homes and trading posts, such as that of the Davidson brothers just under the Black Mountains and 96 in South Carolina. Thomas Jefferson, writing on a lap desk a few weeks later in Philadelphia, described this war. Blaming King George III, the Virginian wrote, he has excited domestic insurrection among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. That was a part of the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. The newly independent states struck back. In one of the first cooperative military actions, they retaliated. Armies came against the Cherokee from Virginia, Georgia, and South Carolina, and North Carolina sent 2,000 volunteers under Brigadier General Griffith Rutherford. Virginia's forces had the Pennsylvania Road into the Great Valley of the Tennessee. South Carolina had the trade routes, and Rutherford had the Blue Ridge Scarp. So that Scotch Irishman climbed the side of the mountain. He used the gap they called Swannanoa, and his army 
with horses and cattle, beat that old Indian trading path into a road through the gap, down the Swannanoa River, across the French Broad, and over the ridge to the Pigeon. And where they went, the Indians fled, leaving corn ready for harvest. And the soldiers destroyed everything. But they opened the road called the Rutherford Trace, and the upper plateau of the French Broad was seen. In 1781, Cornwallis surrendered, worn out by battles in which the hillmen played their part, King's Mountain and Cowpants. The settled east was torn by the war, and the west offered a new beginning. The state of North Carolina offered the land to veterans as back pay and to others at low prices, and other states did the same. From all over the east, they sought new beginnings on the frontier. They moved to Tennessee, to Kentucky, to Alabama, and some came the routes to western North Carolina. In 1793, two brothers demonstrated the future for the mountains. Zebulon and Bedant Baird loaded their wagon in South Carolina with all the supplies a frontier store would need. They hitched the largest horses they could find and somehow climbed Saluda Mountain to the upland plateau. Then, on a hill overlooking the meeting of the French Broad and the Swannanoa River, they joined others in forming the town that was to become Asheville. The Bears had the first wagon to cross the scarp, but others came on foot, on horseback, both before and after. Their names still dominate Western North Carolina. By the next year, 1794, wagons were beating the French Broad Trail into a route to Tennessee. But look at these trails, none fit to be called roads. Here are the routes from the south, old Indian trails joining towns no longer in existence, used by DeSoto and Juan Pardo, Henry Woodward, George Chicken, and John Mills. They tied western North Carolina to the South Carolina trade routes. Here is the Great Pennsylvania Road, stretching from the populous cities of the Northeast to the Great Valley of Tennessee. The French Broad Route tied this valley to the South Carolina trade, as well as to Virginia and the northern regions. Boone's Trail and its extensions were steep and slow to take wagons. They led to the Tennessee Valley, not to the western North Carolina interior. Some few stayed along these routes, but most moved on west. And so, by the 1790s, Western North Carolina had been largely bypassed in the Western movement. The few families who settled took the valleys and left the highlands to later generations. They had no rivers on which to ship heavy farm produce to Eastern markets. They had made crude roads that connected with South Carolina, Virginia, and Tennessee but only the steep trails like Rutherford's Trace led back to the North Carolina population centers. The mountain people were to call again and again for roads, but for generations, all they would see were small improvements to the trails and traces. For railroads were nearly a hundred years in the future. So Western North Carolina became a backwater where the flow of the mainstream passed by, leaving pockets of isolated farms separated by steep ridges and deep valleys. And Western North Carolina remained a region apart. <laughs>